This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hey everyone, this is a big one. Today we're continuing our review of Dune Part 2 from the last show, but this time we are getting into spoilers. This is Marcus, your friendly editor at DuneNewsNet.com, and I can't wait to discuss this movie in depth without holding back. As you'll see in a moment, we're a full house today. Hey everybody, it's Garen. I'm really excited to go through this. Um, I'm glad I have all my peeps here. I need the team support. I'm conflicted, and I can't wait to talk about it. Conflicted. Wow. Yeah, I cannot wait to discuss everything. Um, it's been a wild weekend, opening weekend. Great success at the box office. So the vibes are good and uh, audiences seem to love it. And Messiah seems more assured than ever. So really excited just to talk to everyone today and get everyone's different perspectives. So thanks for uh, joining us. Well, from June Info here, really excited to, to talk to everyone. I wasn't able to join on the last discussion on June part two. So I've been bursting to talk to everyone <laughs> about everything that we've seen and learned and didn't see. Um, so excited to crack on. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm also team conflicted, but I've uh, resolved to represent my 15-year-old self who never thought that she'd have a Dune adaptation of this quality. I'm really excited to talk about it with you all. Hey, everyone. Simon here. Uh, I'm still haunted by some imagery. And I'm dying to know what Garen thinks. So let's get on with this full spoiler review. Dune Movie News. Great. So as mentioned on this episode of Dune Talk, we're going into full spoiler mode. If you haven't watched Dune Part 2 yet, we'd recommend checking out our previous spoiler-free review discussion so that you can get hyped into the movie where we got into the first reactions, highlights, and some criticism. Then, of course, come back here after you've seen the movie. Even if you have read the original novel many times or seen the previous adaptations, this movie is a different experience, and there are some surprises you definitely will want to experience on the first time on the big screen. Before we go in depth, um, Garen, uh, Mark, and Rachel, you couldn't be on our last episode either due to time zones or not having seen the, the movie yet. Uh, so the rest of us are very curious to see, uh, to hear your uh, overall reactions to having seen the movie at least uh, once by this time. Uh, so yeah, uh, Garen, you kick off. I had a, I had a fantastic experience at the biggest IMAX screen in the state, full house. Um, the range of emotions was across the spectrum. Um, it was a beautiful, uh, visceral, the music, the sound could not have been a better experience. I just, I want to lead with that. But at the end of the film, I just had this reaction and and I turned to my wife and I said, I said, honey, I'm a purist <laughs> and, and this is an adaptation. And I knew that all the way along, you guys, and there's nobody better than Vilnov to do this. And he's a master and he's a genius, but I just came away with a feeling of, I just was conflicted. It, it was like, I, I had expected it to be. Uh, more true to what I, I knew of the book. In fact, you guys, I, I went home and I reread the last section of Dune, Prophet section. Mm -hmm. I just needed to kind of connect with what Frank Herbert wrote and what he meant. And then I've been processing it since Frey uh, on, on how Villeneuve depicted and expressed those sentiments and those those character emotional and, and character development uh, threads, I, I just have to say I had a very conflicted experience. And, and I, I, I don't even know how to express it because I'm such a fan. I'm such a fan of the movies and I'm such a fan of, of the books, but I just don't know how to process it. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, I'm glad we can be your support group. <laughs> yes, Bird. we will support you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you have to explain your feelings because I'm sure that a, a lot of the gym community are in the same boat. It's like, it's an amazing movie. You know, I also saw it in, I, I didn't see it in a packed house. I chose um, a, a showing that I knew would be mostly empty because I kind of felt like I needed to be, you know, alone with my thoughts. So there, the people who were in the, the showing that I went to were probably not diehard book fans, which was nice because I had their reactions as like a gauge to rather than going to like a midnight showing or something. Right. 
that helped me. I think that part one was just so much closer to the the book that I I really didn't expect it to have veered so much. But given that, I mean, yes, it was a beautiful film. I think the acting was superb. It sounded amazing. The sound design of Dune has always, always been the one thing that kind of drew me in from the first moment that I saw the first previews. But yeah, I also had that moment at the end where I was like, oh, wait a second. This is not the way that I interpret the ending of this of this book um, in not in theme, but in like emotional impact. For me, my first film was um, a press screening in London was I think it's the second biggest sign act in the UK, full of press critics and stuff like that. So not hardcore Dune fans, as you've mentioned. And everyone had a blast in that. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of laughter, applaud at the end, uh, which is very uncommon in the UK. It's a fantastic film, absolutely fantastic film. But I've read a lot of Dune scripts, made and unmade. The problem has always been that you can feel it on the page. They're trying to put too much on the page. And it's like, Maybe you don't need those characters. Maybe you can get rid of that plot point. Maybe you can streamline it. And I think what Villeneuve has proven is to, to make a fantastic film, you have got to be laser focused. And that's what he's done. He's gone, you know, don't trust charismatic leaders. That is the story I'm telling yep. that supports that core message of Frank Herbert's June of, you know, Paul isn't the good guy. You, you come away, it's like, well, you know, we were all expecting a litre one and a half in there. We'd all convinced that <laughs> he was in there. Uh, we'd all, I, I was waiting to see the guild at the end, um, not necessarily a navigator, you know, Paul, you know, negotiating with the guild and with the emperor and everyone on that. But that's not the story. That's not important to Villeneuve's version of June. C- conflicted, an amazing film. But once again, we've, you know, in some ways, David Lynch's June is more faithful to the book. And Max Avery says, you know, I think he says it in his novel, that Lynch is surprisingly faithful to the novel, apart from the core message. <laughs> yeah, and the Villeneuve's, weirdness. Yeah. Uh, is, Villeneuve's is a complete 180 in that. He's got that core message. There's no horror. There's no Count Fenring. There's no Lito one and a half. There's no guild at the end. Aaliyah is very different. Um, Cheney and Jessica's the characters are shifted, still, still uh, very good. So I'm sure we'll dig into all these points later on. An amazing film, but just not. I, I, I don't think it's possible. I think I think we've proved now, after multiple adaptations, short of a 20 hour miniseries, you can't get a novel on screen. Let's do it. <laughs> no. So Johnny, uh, you you've rewatched the movie uh, several times. Uh, you gave it the first full uh, five out of five stars after seeing it the first time. Now that you have had the multiple viewings, has your perspective changed at all? Did you get additional insights, things you didn't pick up as much on the first time? Yeah, I appreciate you not outing uh, me, Marcus, with my how many views I've actually done up to this point. But um, that might be a little embarrassing. Yes, as you said, I did the review right out the gate. Um, I absolutely, I mean, I was floored by it the first time, and I already had my initial reaction in our more recent episode so people can check that out but for me the rewatches have only they've illuminated more things that i can appreciate more in the film i think just different connections whether it's connections and parallels to things that are in the book that aren't necessarily verbal or visual on screen but if you're looking closely enough or listening closely enough you can kind of gauge them um and then also more connections to like part one different parallels that they have there whether it's different shots or images or character actions things like that you know it's faster paced than part one um so it's a lot to digest i think that initial viewing and that's why i'm really curious obviously i'm not necessarily saying that they should change their opinion but for garen or rachel like just to rewatch it and knowing and being aware of all the different changes things that shock you or surprise you the first time around because for me i had the same reaction in some ways like wow that's very different from the book um, I wasn't expecting that to be included. Um, so I think that was something in my first go around that on subsequent watches, not even necessarily bothered me less because clearly they didn't really bother me the first time, but I can strong, I feel more strongly that, okay, I, I think that's a good way of doing that. Or like, I can appreciate that they didn't choose to include certain things. The first time I saw it was at the press screening. So very different vibe from being in there opening weekend with a bunch of fans or anything like that. 
Um, and then the second time I saw it was at the early preview screening on Sunday. And that was with my whole family, basically. So I was like really kind of like paying attention to them, talking to them, like seeing how they were going to feel about it because none of them have read the books and they had all seen part one and really liked it. Um, but they definitely far preferred part two and uh, they really enjoyed it, like really no, no knocks against it. But getting to watch it by myself in that opening weekend crowd, like later on, I don't know. There was a moment I, I, that I put out there. I was just like, it was when Chani and Paul were doing the sand walk together and the music comes in. And I was just like getting emotional. I was like, wow, this is really like, I can't believe that this actually happens. Like this came into being this <laughs> and it was just, it's not exactly the book. It's not Frank Herbert's Dune. It's to me, Villeneuve's Dune. Um, but I am definitely more of like a film forward or like Villeneuve forward, like, you know, a member of this crew. So for me, like he just speaks so much to like my sensibilities and what I look for. What everything that I look for in a movie is what I got in this, even if there are things that I kind of have to accept and being different from the novel, of course. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like a couple of you have have mentioned about like uh, different experiences watching it at different times because in the press screen that, that Simon and I went to initially, it, like there, there was some press, but it was mainly felt like it was a company event, and a lot of people who maybe weren't as familiar with the book or you know th didn't know doing and then. There were some times when there was some some laughter where like it th threw me off uh, a bit, um, but but then like when I experienced the, the, the movie in in IMAX at the fan first event, like that was out, also people who are like really enthusiastic about Dune, right? Because they're they're looking to get that like limited uh, screening like a, a week or, or almost a week before it opens, and there was like a really different different atmosphere. Like there 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 were a couple of things that that bothered me the first time that like uh, I, I enjoyed more that, that time around. So definitely looking forward to see it multiple uh, times, like. Uh, Gonna, gonna try to catch up to you johnny <laughs> <laughs> and i do have to say i am like ready to be convinced feel free to tell me why i'm wrong because i know i'm wrong i i can't be like if everyone's having such an amazing reaction to a film when it's over and you're the one person going well i mean it was great but i don't think it was better than part one i know i'm wrong somehow so i need Whoa. to be i need to be sold <laughs> and you know what it's Inside every Jim fan, there are two sandworms. That you can't get One for every month's program. And, and Rachel, what, what if, what if you're not wrong? What if it's just the experience of? I mean, let's let's be honest. I've only seen it the one time, right? So Johnny's seen it more than that. Maybe it's an evolution. Maybe it's a processing of all of what Denis is trying to convey, mm -hmm. right? So far, I've only seen it once. Fortunately, I wasn't able to make it to the fan event. I'm going later today with my wife, and I'm curious to know what she thinks. But, you know, at first, my my original text to her was, it's different. And she's like, well, is that bad? I'm like, <laughs> no. And it took me a while. And it took me, like, I think the fan event was on a Wednesday. And it took me until, like, that Saturday to be like, you know, I like some of these changes. They're not perfect. We're, there's some plots that we didn't even get that I, like Garen, like I went back and read the last, you know, part of the book. There's the whole part with Journey not trusting Jessica that we don't even talk about in any of the movies. But the changes work for a film. And like I've said before, I didn't want to copy and paste exactly from the novel. And this is Denise's version. You know, we have the Lynch version. We have the sci-fi version. Sure, there's some characters where I was like, well, it would have been nice seeing them, you know, in the movies. There was stuff with Th Fear Howard that was shot that wasn't there. But I get it. that You have to cut. I'm going to say it a million times. Like, we have the only way you can have a full Dune epic with everything that Frank wrote would be an HBO type of miniseries. And maybe in 20 years, we'll get that. People, when I got out of the movie, people were asking about like Stu Fear, like Tim Blake Nelson, like the Gill Navigators. And I was like, I didn't think about any of that. Like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, I was not even, never, none of that even entered my brain, like going into the screening or like even during the movie. I was just like, I, I don't know if I was just because I had that in my back of my head somewhere, if I was just like so wrapped up in it. But like, I really didn't think of any of those kind of, I guess we could say exclusions at this point. And I bet yeah. you I have a hundred people, hundred people don't even know about Tim Blake. Nelson being cast, or oh, yeah. they're supposed to be the Gill at the end, or the stuff with Through Fear. You know, it's it is a great movie, and I get where it's different than the book, 
there's some parts that still haunt me and will talk to it yeah. and not haunting me in a <laughs> and like, oh, I wish they didn't do that. Like, oh, wow. Denis, you did that. That that was kind of effed up, man, that you went there. <laughs> so. And I think it's also worth noting as like kind of the last thing I'll say is like everyone has their own reaction, like book purists or whatever you want to say. And like everyone else. I mean, Denis, he said many times, like, yeah, he read it when he was a kid. He's reread it. He's a huge fan of the novel. And he just said it in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter uh, that came out over the weekend. They're like, how they basically asked him, like, how do you feel about how it went? Like, you made it finally. You got to like make your dream come true. And he said, you know, it's the greatest thing like he's done. It's, you know, the most difficult thing that he's done. And in particular, like how he had to realize certain things, how he had to exclude certain things from it. And it was obviously like very painful for him. Mm -hmm. Um, and he even said, like, I'll I still need to process it. Like, it's probably gonna take me years to like reflect and feel like, uh, was that the right decision? Like, should I have done that? Um, and like, I guess maybe come to peace with some of those different things. And he's the guy who made the movie. So I think if anyone watches and wishes like, I wish they had done this or that, like that's totally reasonable. Cause even the guy who did it is not, not totally uh, certain. Yeah. So, so it's really to preface the, the rest of the, the episode th there is no wrong perspective, uh, from anybody here in the group or from, from any people who's, who's watching and want to share their thoughts in, in the comments or, or, or in discussions uh, later on. And I think that that even goes back to the original novel. There, there are like some really clear themes that, that Frank Herbert w wanted to convey that he was writing about, that he, he had a message as mentioned about uh, war the warning of charismatic leaders and uh, environmentalism, a bunch of uh, other important themes. But everybody uh, can read a novel and like come away with the, their, their own, own thoughts, their own perspectives. And um, even at different points in their life, like, you know, like I first read it when I, when I was uh, in primary school. And then you're like, I've read it many times later on. And each time I've taken something a different way from it that's applied to different parts of, of my life. So I would say that, you know, th that's, that's the, the beauty of doing that. You can like take away so many different perspectives, even uh, like, uh, yeah, just at different times of uh, your life. Let's start out with the, the remains of uh, House of Trades. And I know that everybody is eager to talk about uh, Alia, <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll get to her soon enough. Uh, first, though, let's talk about her mother. There were many standout performances uh, in this movie, and Rebecca Ferguson's portrayal as Lady Jessica is perhaps one of the most memorable ones. And it really is fitting that we start out with this character, since she's the catalyst for, for the momentous events that happens in the stories, both in the novel and now in the movie adaptation. And uh, Lady Jessica, so she was born and raised as a Bene Gesserit, assigned to House Atreides, and instructed to bear only daughters. But she defied the order, uh, partly out of love uh, for Duke Leto, uh, who wished for a male heir and partly for her own purposes, and she conceived a boy. And she did this in knowledge that her son had the potential to be the Quizzes Hadrach. Whereas um, Lady Jessica takes a backseat in the latter third of the novel, here in the second movie, which is adapting that section, uh, she remains an important character throughout. Uh, Rachel, the development of Jessica plays out very differently in, the, in this movie. What did you think of the portrayal, and do you believe that the movie did uh, justice to her character? I think they absolutely did justice to her. I actually really liked the changes for Jessica. I thought that um, it did obviously give give a great actress more to do in this in this film. And you know, her the the design of her was amazing, and the emotions that she gets to to portray. I mean, it also gives her um, an arc, right? Like in the first film, we're seeing a character who has maybe made some choices without regard to the consequences or knowing that those consequences are going to fall on her maybe but not thinking that they would fall on everyone else um and now she's hardened and this gives us sort of a, a view into why she's making those decisions to protect her children that's all she has left and you know for the love of her children you know and, and she's willing to become something maybe slightly villainous um even if if Paul doesn't want her to. And I, I really like that. I thought it gave her a lot uh, more of a, a well-rounded arc. We are talking about charismatic leaders and we're talking about Paul nonstop, but Jessica becomes one of those charismatic leaders after the water of life, how she tells the Fremen and how she, you know, plays the Fremen, and especially when she goes down south to really be like, my son is, the Messiah, you need to listen to him. You need to trust him. So I thought Lady Jessica was amazing, and she is one of the top performances and one of the highlights of the film. Because like I've said in previous episodes, 
you take Jessica p- from part one, and like Rachel just said right now, she is a different character. She is hardened, you know, with the time on Arrakis. You know, I forgot what the quote is exactly, but it's something like God made Arrakis to t- test the faithful. And that's right there for Jessica. That's from the book. There's a recent interview with uh, Rebecca Ferguson, and she says in there, you know, after the water of life, Jessica is a different person. You know, it is a different character. Um, so that's even from the actress herself. She she recognizes that fundamental change in her personality. Um, whether or not that's due to Aaliyah being awakened inside her, and then so she's part Jessica, part Aaliyah. You know, how how much of, you know, is it Bruce Banner and the Hulk? I I couldn't wish for a better Jessica. I, I had my doubts when she was first cast. And even on part one, she's a strong actress, but I always wonder if, you know, how another actress would have portrayed her. Uh, but absolutely strong performance in part two. Dutch, I'm a big Mission Impossible fan. Um, that's like one of my favorite film franchises. And I, I still remember in theaters in 2015, seeing her for the first time. And I was like, oh, but like this lady is incredible. Um, and she's been a, like a mainstay in that franchise and I've loved her. But to see, I, as soon as she was cast, I was like, she's absolutely going to crush it. Like this is her big, not break necessarily, but she's going to be a massive presence in, in these films. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, everything that I hoped for, like came to fruition in this movie, watching that. Um, and I think also the other kind of thing that's been running through my head is obviously we'll get to the Harkonnens a little bit later. Austin Butler's incredible as fade. The real antagonist of this movie is Jessica. Like she is in direct opposition to Paul in a lot of ways in terms of what he's looking for, like what he wants to actually have happen. Um, and what happens with Jessica basically, you know, manipulating him, forcing his hand into, you know, partaking in this, uh, you know, well, well, we can call it what we want, but this prophecy and then what ultimately happens at the end of the movie. Like she is just very, like I've seen other people online talking about her and she's so sinister and like, like just all these different descriptors. You're like, wow, this sounds like a really like evil, like <laughs> malignant character. Um, and she certainly has that, that aura around her. And I think, um, I'm just like running through my mind that little like smile she has after Paul's speech, like literally just like chills. Like it's, it's, it's a really impressive performance, especially given that it's not the most like verbal performance either. Like it's a lot of like facial expressions, slight like movements and gestures, things like that. Uh, just real quick. I, I really like what Villeneuve did with Jessica because it really is a representation of who the Benny Chesser really are because because Jessica is a mother, she, she loves her children. And on top of that, she was trained as a Bene Gesserit and the level of deception and manipulation and control in the shadows, that's where she comes from. So I, I think that was a really accurate choice and a, and a dramatic choice that really, actually, that really resonated with me. But let's not forget that it's not just that she's becoming even more of a Bene Gesserit and using the skills that she's to learn from them, she's becoming more Fremen, right? She has endless lines of Fremen, Reverend Mother's now, you know, she has their memories. Why wouldn't her perspective change to be more Fremen forward, to be more invested in all of those things that those women were working for? Uh, because like, we're not also just talking about the, the survival of House Atreides. We're talking about the survival of a very specific vision of the Fremen. And now she's become an agent of that. Um, I have other thoughts about what happened to Alia, but I think that, it, you know, Jessica was given something really cool to do. And I, I like the villainous kind of because also like later on in the book, she's kind of like very she does not regret anything she did. So <laughs> she has much she has like a, a villain, mm-hmm. you know, art. Yeah, so that's a good uh, transition that brings us to, to Alia. And due to the mystery that remained for so long around her, perhaps the most speculated on character in the lead up to this film. So it's important to give a bit of context uh, that in the book, uh, several years do pass between the time when, uh, when Paul and Jessica joined the Fremen and the final battle at Arakeen. And during that time, Alia is born. And due to, to her exposure to the water of life, even as an infant, uh, she has a full awareness of an adult uh, with memories from hundreds of generations of her female ancestors. Needless to say, many of the Fremen are terrified by her, and that leads to a lot of tensions in the siege. Uh, here in the movie, Alia is li- likely, um, in the same way she transformed when Jessica drinks the water of life, 
However, the big difference is that she starts to communicate directly with Jessica from the womb. And in terms of timeline, it looks like it's only, let's say around five or seven months uh, that pass over the course of uh, Dune Part 2, because at the end, uh, basically Jessica is still, still pregnant with, with her. Um, Garen, uh, you've been a fan of the book for, for many decades and uh, experienced the previous two adaptations as they came out, uh, David Lynch's uh, movie in 1984, the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries in 2000. And both of those did portray Alia as an adult in a small child's body with all the strangers that that entails. So were you disappointed that we didn't get that element in these new movies? And how did you feel that the approach worked out story-wise? I was disappointed. I really, I really thought that it was possible. I know we've speculated on here in the past that, you know, could you make a two-year-old toddler Aaliyah with, you know, all the sensibilities of an adult and, and the memories of a Reverend Mother, could you make that work on screen? Could you make that interaction, whether it's CGI or whatever? Yes, yes, you could. And so I, I did miss that as an opportunity to experience that because I think that's one of the most unique things about the book Dune, uh, to have a, honestly, to, I mean, I've raised toddlers, right? I mean, they're really hard. They're really difficult. And, and yet this one is a fully aware, conscious adult, reverend mother, so to speak. I just thought that was a really missed opportunity. And, and quite frankly, I think Villeneuve could have absolutely pulled it off. I thought it was done very well. I, I, I was with it. It didn't feel jarring or strange. Um, in fact, I even really loved the interaction. I can't remember exactly which part of the film where uh, Jessica's standing next, next to Paul and Paul's asking Aaliyah questions through Jessica. Like, I really liked that interaction. It, it sort of, uh, united the little family as it were. And I, so there were some elements of it that I thought really worked well and it was done tastefully and it was done in a way that remains true, uh, to Aaliyah. But honestly, I, I think that was one of the reasons I really walked out going, Oh, I really wanted to see that. And I thought Vilna was going to do it. So that was a little bit sad for me. There was rumors floating around that, you know, Aaliyah wasn't going to be in it, at least not in the way we know or expected. So I'd kind of mentally prepared myself for that change. But yeah, I'm a huge fan of the David Lynch film and Alicia Witt's portrayal of Aaliyah in that is super creepy and just excellent. And it's one of the wonderful, weird elements of Lynch's Dune. You know, I was okay with it. And for the longest time on this show, I was the one that's like, I want to see little baby o Olia. But like the whole wound talking, especially so early on, I was like, okay, we're going to get a different type of Olia. And maybe because I knew there wasn't the two year time gap. So in my, in my lizard brain, I was like, okay, well, I know that she can't be born, even if she's pre-born you know we're not going to get that and one of the shots that i keep saying that keeps haunting me is very much one of the last i think it's one of almost the last shot is me and mark were talking about this before we started recording is with jessica and Aaliyah's like mm. what's going on and she's jessica's like be gone this war has and me and mark both had agree that it totally gives us Clone attack of the clones, but I like that Olia is aware of what's going on, even if she's not born yet. She's communicating with Jessica; they're having that relationship. And Paul is also he cares about his sister already, so it's going to be interesting how they're going to bring all that into Messiah. I'm okay with the Olia switch. Yes, I would have loved to see a little baby Olia stabbing the Baron. <laughs> Again, we'll get into that, you know. And also, does she still keep the name Saint Olia of the Knife? Like she has no sainthood now. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, or unless she does something early in Messiah, or we talk about it later on in one of those scenes. Like it never happened, but you know this happened. All right, I have to say my piece. <laughs> What's that? Um, <laughs> I am fine with the fact that you know it's like he condensed the timeline. You know, I, I am looking at this as an adaptation. Everything he does has to serve the core story that he wants to tell. Denis didn't want to make it be three years long, four years long. Fine, that's great. We don't have time for there to be a, a functional talking baby walking around. 
Um, and I was okay with that. I was sort of prepared for that. Uh, I got excited when I saw, you know, Anya show up at the premiere because I thought, oh, we're going to get like a flash forward. We're going to get something. So I was like waiting for that scene, you know, and essentially he's not he's not going to do children, right? He's really only setting up Messiah. So there's no real reason for Alia to have that connection with the Baron beyond her revealing that information, you know, the, the, the big twist. Um, but I hated the talking fetus because... Because maybe I'm just sensitive. I'm a woman watching this movie. I don't like that Jessica was reduced to, in some ways, a vessel for this baby to give her orders. I would, and like you can read it that they were in collaboration or whatever, but I, I just didn't like it. I, you know, and, and being a filmmaker, I'm sure is about picking your battles and having a kid walking around on set was a battle he didn't want to have. And I get it. And I think he did convey through the way that he chose to have like Jessica, you know, continually muttering to herself. Uh, you know, it, it worked. I think the audience completely understood what was happening. Me personally, I just hate it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I miss out on, you know, killer baby with a knife, but, uh, I just didn't, I just, the talking fetus thing just rubbed me the complete wrong way. Well, let me, um, I haven't gone yet. So let me just mention yeah. a couple of things. Um, Rachel, I totally understand, uh, your feelings about that. I think that's totally valid. And I, I understand why, um, yeah. to Mark, what Mark was saying, <clears throat> you know, I haven't seen the Lynch film, so I can't speak to it. <laughs> However, I do know a lot of people like it a lot. And in particular, they love the depiction of this character. I, I can imagine it's similar. Villeneuve talked about the Baron. He's like, the Baron was so kind of like super weird, super almost like goofy in the Lynch film. In response to that, and I've seen people that are fans of the Lynch version say they don't really like the Baron in this one because he doesn't have that same like energy about him. So I think he almost in response to that Baron, he went in this totally different direction in terms of tone and style and everything the way that that handled in the Lynch movie. I think he enjoys the Lynch movie probably on some level, obviously. And I think he was, he probably felt like it would be a, a bit of an uphill battle to try and like pursue that same type of depiction, maybe that it's hard to like reach that level. So again, it's all creative decisions. So who knows everything it, working with kids can be difficult, et cetera, et cetera. I think right. to, to Garen's point, it probably could have, I think he's so talented. I think he could have made it work had he pursued it, but I get why he didn't. I wanted this movie to be a little bit weirder than part one. And I think a lot of fans felt that way. And talking to my family afterwards, talking to some other friends that have seen aren't familiar with the book or anything, like obviously that's talking fetus is weird. It's like that weird, is, yeah. that's an objectively weird thing, positively or negatively. So like, I think I was like, okay, I can like chalk that off as to like, that's, that's a weird way to do it. Man. It's funny that you it said was. that because I really thought that Denis has toned down the weird as much as possible. Oh, I thought I because, yeah. you know, it was like, oh, we're not going to actually show people having visions and like working through all of that. We're just going to watch people from outside yeah. of their bodies do that in their own head. And I thought that was a really interesting choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Jessica's probably the most, you know, to the right on the on the like scale of like. Oh, yeah, they're just having a vision and they're having a dream to like maybe fully being a little fit like manifestingly weird well what i was going to say let's be honest the best baby movie ever is who's who's uh look who's talking yeah no exactly i don't that's <laughs> john volts the 1989 yeah. classic there you go that's mm. what was happening in my mind when that was happening i was like oh no is john travolta gonna talk to me in my mind now <laughs> So as mentioned with Aaliyah not being born, she's also not the one to kill the Baron uh, like she did in the book. Uh, instead, in the movie, this deed is committed by her brother, Paul Trades. Uh, so yes, that, that brings us to this uh, movie's main character. Over the course of, uh, of the story, Paul undergoes a dramatic transformation himself. He goes from being that noble boy who was hesitant to kill Jamis in a fair fight. And he, at the end of the movie, he, he's a vengeful man who remorselessly slays his grandfather, the Baron who is lying defeated on the ground already. And he gives the word to begin a holy war that will ravage the universe and claim billions of lives. Whereas the book and previous two screen adaptations end with it still being possible to see Paul as the protagonist um, and someone that readers or viewers could root for. By the end of Dune Part 2, it's clear as day that he is not a hero. Setting aside all of the various uh, changes to the characters and story in this movie, uh, some more of which we're going to uh, discuss next. Uh, Mark, would you agree or disagree that this version of Paul on screen is the most faithful 
to the intentions of Frank Herbert and the themes that he was trying to convey in the book. Um, yeah, I, I don't see there's any argument against that, really. I mean, it's not the pull from the book that Villeneuve has said, you know, he's got the advantage of having read the subsequent novels. And so he, he wants to incorporate Frank Herbert's core message of not trusting charismatic leaders. I think Xiaomi brought his A game from the beginning of the movie till the very end. Talk about character arc. And I'm not even talking about like from part one to from the end of part two, just the beginning, like when you see Zendaya talking with and, you know, talking about the accents from the south to the north with Paul being confused and not understanding what's going on till the very last time you see him, you see that evolution of, I don't want to say the Messiah character, but the charismatic leader that, no, I'm in charge now. And as soon as Paul drinks the water of life and tells Jessica about his vision, how there's different paths and he needs to go on this one, it's, it's a whole different character. I was really pleased with how Shalome, uh executed this performance because there, there really was a lot of layers to him. Um, I've talked about being conflicted. He was also very conflicted, right? Because he's falling in love with Chani. He realizes his role with the Fremen. He realizes the manipulation of the Bene Gesserit. He's aware of all this and he makes the best series of decisions he can. And I thought that was very, very human. And, and I related to that, but I also thought that the performance was well done enough that there was never a moment when I thought, oh, okay, calm down, Shalami, like, not. right. It's like when he was intensely aggressive and, uh, and being extremely charismatic, it was appropriate. He was doing it at the right time. He was doing it for a reason. Um, when he was fighting fade, he was appropriately, uh, in, in a position of knowing what was on the line and what the stakes were and how he, he, uh, performed in that fight. So I actually really liked how, uh, Paul's yes, different than the book, but, but I liked how it evolved. I felt like I was seeing the transformation of this character into something that was disturbing, which was what Frank Herbert was trying to communicate. You could have had another actor really butcher that role. I mean, imagine a young Nicolas Cage as a Paul Atreides <laughs> at this point, it would have been over the top. But what was great about Tim Tim is that he evolved as time. Like the way I look at it is like, kind of like a meter, like, okay, okay. We're getting Paul, we're getting Paul. Oh, now it's Maldives time. <laughs> Like, it wasn't just instantly like, no, I'm going to be this total tyrant. We saw it happening slowly by slowly. And his relationship with Chani is just heartbreaking. The movie does not work if this performance is not good. It's like, it, it, does, it has to meet the level of like what's going on in the story. And it's obviously a very complex story. Um, and we already saw him in part one. He nails the role of like this kind of young like boy, just like try, trying to learn all these different things uh, about this new world and like the things that are happening politically. Um, but in part two, like, and I think people have been, especially in like the realm of like film Twitter and like that, that, that like community that really watches a lot of movies, like Chalamet has obviously been very popular, but there's still been like certain detractors like, ah, he's overrated, ah, he's overhyped, things like that. I have seen literally nothing but pure praise and people like coming around to him the last few days because I think if you have been skeptical of him and even people I've talked to again in real life that have been like, ah, I like him, but I always feel like he's like, you know, X, Y, Z, like everyone has been like, wow, like he really, he does something different in this movie that you haven't really seen him do before. And of course it's in such a big movie too. It's you know, a smaller project by any means. Um, he is just so he, he's, you know, as Johnny says, he's sincere. Like he does have that, like that he's, he's just learning. Like he's kind of just coming into his own and, he has that charm about him, which eventually turns into like charisma and like a manipulative like a quality. Um, and I think that all culminates like when he walks in to give that speech, like it is so magnetic. Like it is, and I, a lot of people have been talking about that scene in particular online. Um, 
it like it is just really striking and it's such the whole movie like rotates on the axis of that scene i think um and uh, i think he absolutely nailed it and i was very pleased overall with just how they they built it up um and build handled the the arc of that character because as as simon was saying it wasn't too abrupt it wasn't too rushed in my opinion it was just just right and there's like that that conflict going on inside of him and you feel it like he is emotional about it and and then also when he flips the switch he takes the water of life like it's game over like he's he's locked in as they say yeah he has to choose to become what they all want him to be and i i really i liked that that agency was made really clear because it makes the fall that much more tragic for us because we know that he's in this relationship with Chani and he says to her multiple times, I will love you for as long as I breathe, which is very romantic. And they have, we have all the long lingering looks and the time on the dunes, but then he ultimately chooses this, you know, this other life, which I think bookends really well with that last shot of Chani. Um, That really worked for me. I think, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul is magnetic. That's a good word. Um, it was very enjoyable to watch it wasn't a slog it was breathtaking in a three-hour film (laughs) i might get a bunch of hate mail for this but i honestly think his performance is as powerful as al pacino's in the original godfathers when you when you think about it the uh, arc of michael and the godfather you know nice college kid you know all that (laughs) kind of like that's Paul, you know, and then with the death of Jameis, we slowly see it. And, you know, the last shots don't play out like the last shot of the original Godfather, but it kind of gives me that weird, it's not the same anymore. Everything has changed for this family, these people around them. You know, I think Shalmay brings his A-game. This might be his best performance since uh, Call Me By Your Name. A little weird to have it out at the same time as Wonka, right? Like, right? Yeah. What, what a, what a, yeah. <laughs> like, that's the same guy? Okay. I, I don't want to get into that too much now, but I really do hope that we are going to get some recognition in the, in the award season for the actors uh, this time, because, you know, it doesn't matter that this is science fiction or whatever the genre. I think you just need to look at the performances uh, in themselves. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I would say, um, uh, t- touching back on, on, the, on the changes. So, as as mentioned, I, I I was saying that I think um, you know Villeneuve could have written certain changes like to be more faithful to the to the book and still hit all the thematic notes. I think you know Elliot could have been born and and he could have still like hit everything he was going for. But when it comes to Paul killing the Baron, to me this was a stroke of genius because as mentioned, once Paul takes that water of life, he gains full clarity over future past. This is true prescience, granting granting him the ultimate power. And whether it's power itself that corrupts people or the corruptible being attracted to power, it's clear that that's what's happening here to Paul. So he appears to lose part of his his humanity. And Frank Herbert was really warning readers of the dangers of charismatic leaders. And while that message maybe didn't fully register with many until the second book, uh, Dune Messiah, with this movie, Denis Villeneuve has stated from the beginning that he brought that theme to the forefront. So in the end, first with uh, the Baron and then after the fate fight when he walks to the Emperor with that bloody knife, it's clear here that Paul is walking the, the path of the re- revenge. And that brings us to the, to the Fremen, the, the people who, um, who become the instruments of uh, the Trades' revenge. So let's start out with, uh, with Chani. So she's standing right next to Paul as one of the movie's leads. Uh, whereas in the book, we're privy to the inner thoughts of many characters. In the movie, it's like we're experiencing Paul's story arc from Chani's perspective. Uh, due to her romantic relationship with him and the fact that she doesn't actually believe in the prophecy at all, She's one of the few Fremen who see Paul for who he really is, especially after uh, Jessica has actively converted all the other um, non-believers. And that's especially um, important because in the book, uh, Chani is a religious leader. She's a Saedina who may uh, become a reverend mother eventually. Like if Jessica hasn't shown up, maybe it would have been Chani who had been the next reverend mother. So here that aspect of the character is actually removed completely. And instead, she's more of a warrior leader. Yeah, and then over a year ago with the trailers for this movie, we had discussed here on Dune Talk whether Chani is a completely different person in the movies compared to the book. And there's no doubt about uh, that now. Like, this couldn't be any more different in terms of uh, characters. Uh, Johnny, you had mentioned before that in the book, a book Chani is not necessarily your favorite character. And what you felt we were seeing from trailers 
uh, looks more promising. So what are your thoughts overall on this version of Chani? And did you find her relationship with Paul to be believable? And I'm going to be real in the book. I did not care about Chani or their relationship, really. Like, there's not really much meat on the bone there. It, for me, it's more when I read Messiah. I was like, okay, this is a lot more interesting. And I think what they do in this movie really, like, tease that up as, like, as much as possible, which I think works to its advantage. Um, but for me, yeah, I think the actual relationship um, was was really well done. I thought it was, it's like just enough to make you care, like believe that they, you know, could like fall for one another. It definitely has that. I think I mentioned our first reactions, like it has that kind of like first love, like high school crush, like type vibe to it. And then obviously <laughs> given their scenario with, that they're living through in their environment, like it becomes this more serious and epic, uh, uh, you know, love story. But it comes down to the depiction of Chani and like how Zendaya's performance works for the character. I thought she did a really great job. I thought that um, she hasn't been in like that many movies where she has like a leading role or like has like something really substantial to do. Um, I like her a lot in Euphoria, the show. Um, I think she's great in that. When the ending hits, like I, I felt like emotional about it. Like it felt like a, there was an actual gut reaction to it. Um, and it's a different ending than the book. And I think for me, obviously, I was a little bit more open maybe to that than than some others. But like for me, it was just like wow, that like that was like a gut punch. Like that feels like a really great like stamp on that ending and where this book you know leaves off versus what we're going to get in messiah i thought it worked really well for the relationship between paul and chani uh just that that difference of opinion that i don't believe in you um in fact that's how chani's relationship began with paul in part one it's like you know you're not you're not the least on all guy evil i'm just going to tell you straight up and i hope you die with paul. they are still falling in love with each other and I really did like that layered evolution of their relationship. Um, was it the best choice to have her be a warrior leader versus a religious leader? I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not so sure I'm completely sold on that. Although it does make for, for better, uh, cinematic experience. I, I did like how that layered into their relationship. Someone on Twitter pointed out that, uh, you know, we first see Chani at the beginning of part one. She's the first kind of face we see, and then we see her face at the very end of part two. And I think I, I did like the choice of having the story almost seen through her eyes and told from her perspective. I just don't, again, having a little bit of trouble with just that characterization and role change from the book. I think she did a fantastic job. There was never a moment I was out of her performance. Every moment I was believing exactly what she was how she was acting it out. So she is a fighter in the film, uh, in the book. Uh, and having a fight alongside Paul in the movie makes for that relationship to, to grow in a more natural way, as opposed to, say, Paul and Shani's love grew, just to sort of cover <laughs> for a multiple <laughs> sins. Is literally, um, Somehow the emperor returned. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but you know what? You're you're all right. I think like the maybe if there is a problem with Chani in the novels, it is that there's a power imbalance between them. Um, especially, you know, she once she you know believes in Paul, you know, she becomes a secondary. Chani is our entryway into this story. She is our relatable character, and she is the person who is giving us our moral lens. And because I think we talked about this in another episode, Chani's not Liet's daughter in this version. Or at least it's never said. So, you know, she would not have been um, raised in both worlds, right? So to speak. So it gives her an even more uh, specific lens to, to, look at, to look at what Paul and his mother are doing to the Fremen. So I like that. I like that they bring her up in rank almost, right? They are equals. And they even explicitly say, I would, you know, we are equals to each other. He's not even so, you know, he's on this path to emperorship. And that is not what he promised her right it's not what they talked about it's a betrayal of their relationship and it's not just about the fremen it's about their personal relationship and i thought that really worked it's interesting the first time we really see chani or hear chani in that opening monologue in part one she's like who are our next oppressors in a way she falls in love with the man that is in charge of the next wave of oppressors for her people I do love that we got Fremen warrior Chani because it's going back and like reading the last part of the book. She's, she's a great character, 
but she's not developed until Messiah. And I feel like what Denise did was really develop this character. And it makes you wonder, like, how are they going to develop Messiah? Because it's not like we're going to have, sure, we're going to have a Dune TV show. It's going to be about the sisterhood, but it's not going to be like these side stories like we get in Star Wars, like, oh, Chani and Paul meet up and everything is honky dory now and everyone loves each other. And it started raining on the rack. It's <laughs> random rain. That's going to be a big question. Like, how are they going to bring that storyline back to Messiah where they're, they're in love again? And, you know, the other thing that we were talking about, we started talking about this for months, was the blue scarf. And the um, I saw, I think it was in the art and vision of Dune. It doesn't say anything about a child being born. It just says that it's a fragment culture where a woman is in love or is taken by someone. Mm. So it's kind of like okay. an engagement ring. Yeah, and, and I said, said this in the, in the previous, like, spoiler-free episode, but I, I felt that um, while Chinese and, and Paul's relationship did work for me, I felt it could have used more, more time, especially in, in the beginning, to see that transition, because obviously at the beginning she's very distrusting of him and she's watching from, from far. Um, so I would have, would have liked to see more of that. Of course, I, I did like the, you know, the, the scenes of them fighting side by side in battle, and I think that, that helped. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of people talk about like how, you, you know, it's, it can be difficult to reconcile how she hates everything that she, he, like Paul represents, but at the same time she falls in love with him. But I think it's really easy to forget that, you know, that they're, they're teenagers, you know, and this is like so typical for, as I think, John, you were mentioning like a, like high, high school feeling. So, so that's what it, what it really feels to me. So um, I think the relationship was convincing uh, to me as well, but I think it's interesting how it left off because is this, you know, like a high school crush that happens for, you know, like six, seven months and then like, you know, something happens uh, or is this going to be like a love that, that's, that, that lasts like, like you do see in, in a novel. So that, I mean, that, that question is still open, at least in uh, the news adaptation. I like that point though, like going back to like the kind of high school romance. And also I think I get like, it's different from the book, obviously, but I feel like if you've seen Messiah or seen Messiah, not yet, if you've read Messiah, like. I don't get like why people feel so like this is so disruptive, like as an ending or like why it like leaves some sort of like confusion about like what's going to happen in Messiah. Like to me, it just seems like I guess people are interpreting it as like, are they like broken up? Like, are they not going to be together? Um, but to me, it was just more like she's upset and she's like, obviously she's upset like of what just happened, like anyone would be. Um, I think sometimes like if you get in a fight with your partner, like you leave. Like you go and you can drive in the car, or like you know something like that. Like this is obviously she's very, driving like, the worm. It's a, yeah, she's it's driving a stress the drive. She's playing some tunes. Um, so like <laughs> she's going through it, and like I think that's just like it's it's just a more emphatic representation of like what is going on. Obviously, it's not the most subtle thing in the world, but like it obviously gets the point across. Of she says earlier after he takes the water of life, for anyone in doubt, like she'll come to understand. Like I've seen it or something like that. So like. That to me also like leaves no doubt that they are going to stay together in some capacity, but it's leaving it kind of open more so for, you know, non-book readers, in my opinion, as to what's going to happen. Although if you've read Messiah, you already know. Yeah, we need I'm a just... Messiah predictions episode. <laughs> oh, I've got a lot I'm of down for that. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> I just wish that Paul had, there's a line in the novel where he, he tells Chani that, you know, Irland will have no more of his love than a touch or, or I can't remember the exact line. Right. And I just wish there was that kind of recognition from Paul that Chani's going to be really upset about what he's what he's done, and he's just kind of like, "Yeah, she'll get over it, fine, whatever." I mean, they've given Chani such modern sensibilities in this interpretation, so I think that it's really necessary for her to react negatively at the end because even though he's like, "Hey, stuff might happen you don't like," <laughs> you know, I yeah. you know, I still love you. Don't worry about it. That's not enough. <laughs> That's enough to like start an intergalactic war for your boyfriend and then like you're almost dead and you know your whole family's been killed and you show up and he's like i'm gonna marry this chick over here. i mean it's like i think that her reaction made a lot of sense um i like that it ended on her face on her yeah. rage because 
you know, the last line of the novel is really about, you know, and, and obviously in this version, Chani and, and and Jessica are not friends, so they wouldn't be confiding in each other. No. They wouldn't be like respectful of each other in that way. So that conversation couldn't happen. But it's it's that kind of like these relationships are going to continue to influence how Paul rules what he does next um yeah. and i like that i like that it's center stage to me it does set up uh messiah it's the only thing that sets up messiah i have other <laughs> things to say about that but um yeah it was i had no problems with that i thought it was actually kind of thrilling to see her fight and be you know a badass so. and, and marcus i know we have to move on one last thing i gotta say <laughs> The last shot of the movie, they make a point earlier about like crying, like from and do not like cry, basically. Um, and in that last shot, like her like lips are like quivering, like their tears are welling up. So like all throughout that last scene, like she's trying to hold it together and she knows like I got to get the hell out of here because I'm about to lose it. <laughs> and so I just think like as Rachel's saying, like there is that modern sensibility to it, but there's also in world tying in the meaning of like that larger emotion. And this isn't someone dying. It's she's losing like her loved in this formal situation. Um, I just like the this, the symbolism of that shot and to, on top of it just being a great, you know, close up. We see like Paul is further away from us as the audience and from from Chani. So yeah, there is definitely that distance that that uh, that we're seeing at the end there. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, we're on, while uh, Chani knows for sure that Paul really is is not a prophet, uh, Stilgar doesn't need much convincing to believe he's one of the Fremen from the South who, at least in the movie, are far more religious than the Northern tribes. And that's also um, an element, as mentioned, that, that's specific to, to this uh, adaptation. From the beginning of the movie, Stilgar wants Paul to be the one, and every additional sign, quotation marks, uh, just fuels his fanaticism. In some cases, it reaches a comical level. Um, Simon, how, how did you feel about Stilgar in, in this movie? Did you have a favorite scene with him? Well, like I've said on our spoiler-free episode, Stilgar is one of the highlights of this movie for me. Because he's so devoted on the Lisan Agaid and just being like, Paul is the one. He will bring, you know, balance to the to the force weight. Now that's a different movie. Um but no, I just love his will and just being like, I've seen it. This is this is what we've been asking for this whole entire time. Yes, he is comical. You know, I thought he was very comical. When we saw the IMAX preview with the sand warm writing, we saw in the trailer, you know, when he's like, nothing too fancy, don't embarrass me. I think it's a good balance. A movie that's very dark and you need Stilgar to be a little bit comic relief here and there. And I love that there's a difference between the South and the North. It, it's also very political when you think about it. It's two different type of political system, you know, these people believe in the Lisana Gai, and some of these people don't. Stilgar, Javier Bird then is awesome in it. And I wanted him to show that, yes, look, what I believe is actually coming true. Now, he might not realize how bad it is that it's coming true in this movie, but like the last <laughs> shot of <laughs> them riding the sandworm and leaving, you know, for space made me go, oh, I want more. Like, I'm intrigued. Those are the shots that hunt me. Like, seeing them going, okay, we're going to go out in space, and I want to see the 61 billion genocide. And I don't think they said, I know, it's, it's messed up. It's messed up on me. But you know what? I don't think they said jihad once nope. in the movie. They've said holy war a couple of times. But they made sure they don't say the word jihad. So I think that that was Denis trying to make sure that this film wasn't interpreted. And this goes back to some of the other changes made that I, actually I don't really like. Um, that it's not about resources, right? That this is not an allegory for, for yeah, for oil and, and, and all of that. Um, but that it is about taking advantage of a, of a specific situation. I mean, we have Chani, who was the non-believer. We have Stilgar, who was the believer. So... With Stilgar, we get that that first person perspective of like what Paul is doing, like why they go along with it. And, you know, I think we definitely needed, like you said, a little bit of, of levity sometimes because it was a some of these concepts are really heavy and it helped us. It just helped us get through some of those scenes. But um, 
Stilgar also like kind of him losing his 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 teacher, his friend to become a zealot is like its own little mini tragedy. So I really I thought I thought that I I, I personally was OK with Stilgar being a little bit of the, the funny guy. I know some people have reacted negatively against that just because like, well, he's he's the guy, right? He's the guy that like sticks around forever that you can always depend on. I mean, at one point he's up to the point where he's like. Only the leaders can speak the siege. Kill me so you can be the leader. Yeah. But Paul still has a little bit of humanity. And it's like, no, it's cool. I'm not going to kill you. Still, God does become a religious zealot. I think there's a line in one of the later books where like, Paul wonders at what point Still, God went from being a Fremen naive to a zealot. Yeah. Um, so that, that part is sort of faithful to the series, if not to Dune itself. The problem I had with Stilgar was, as I saw it in the press screening, and Stilgar was getting big laughs. And there's one line in particular where Paul says, you know, he's not Mardi, um, he's not there, he's not there in the side. And Stilgar, right afterwards, is talking to the other Fremen and says, ah, only the Mardi would be so humble as to say he's not Mardi. That proves it. And all that was playing in my mind was from Monty Python's Life of Brian, where I'm not the Messiah. Only the Messiah would be so humble. Only the Messiah would deny his divinity or something like that. That just proves you're the Messiah. And so that parallel, all after that, Stilgar is just Monty Python in my head. Um, and so that, that kind of reduced his strength. You know, Stilgar is this powerful leader of the Fremen. And all I can see is like John Cleese in the background. <laughs> I mean, well, to they, your point, I think that's exactly what's happening, right? Like, yeah. it, it, it's the, what are they, there's a, a, a Dune quote where it's like, religion is the cart. It's like the, the cart yeah, without yeah. a horse or the, something like that, where it's like, Paul isn't even really necessary. The, the Fremen want this to happen, and he's just kind of stepping in and mm -hmm. fulfilling the role. Yeah, and I have to say that that, that, that scene, it actually really bothered uh, bothered me a lot because as mentioned, when we were in that first press screening, there, there was a lot of laughs. And, you know, there, there, are, there are some scenes with, with Stilgar. Don't get me wrong. I, I loved uh, Javier Bardem's performance uh, with the movie and especially that, that scene with the, with the naming of, of Paul where, where he gives him a name, he gives him a hug. I thought that was so sincere. And, um, you know, also the interaction with, with Gurney when they were talking about the atomics and that added uh, levity in a natural way. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the moment where, you know, the, it was felt some some cases where it was played for for laughs i i felt it undermined the message of the, the movie you know still and his people are being deceived and that hits really close to home for what's happening in so many parts of the world today on both sides of various issues i'm not singling anything out there but i, I would have liked to see them approach these moments more solemnly like more with um let's say like more of an ominous tone uh, rather than trying to like you know fit comic relief where, where it wasn't needed so that, that that was that was my my main problem I think choosing to have some comic relief was was absolutely necessary. I mean, in anything as heavy as this, and and I know we've drawn parallels to Empire Strikes Back, but you've got some you got some moments in that film that you know people laugh and it just kind of lets up with the heaviness of the of the themes. I wish instead of having Stilgar be the one that created the comic relief, I wish they would have chosen another character, maybe less as central uh, to, to to Stilgar because. Stilgar really represented me to me. I expected, and, and look at him in part one, like in part one, he fit kind of what I expected Stilgar to do and say and respond. And, and so this was a little bit too much of a departure for me for the Stil Stilgar character. Um, just because he, he is a, he's a significant leader among the Fremen. He, I, I just don't know that that fit kind of what I had expected, but I agree with the levity. I think that was necessary. And I think it helped. I just wish it would have been someone else. I, I loved Bardem in this movie. I, and I've spoken to a few different people that thought he was the best character, like the most, uh, you know, interesting performance in the movie. I think why people are responding to that so well or why they have that, that high opinion of him is, well, he's a fantastic actor, but he plays the, what we'll say, the more comedic or humorous moments earlier in like the first half of the movie or so really well. But then by the time that Siege Tower is attacked, and he's, you know, telling Paul, like, you need to kill me, like, me go do this. And then during Paul's speech and then during down the stretch, once they get to the, the uh, Arakeen residence, like, it's not like he's not funny anymore. Like he is he has totally gone down this path. It's it's like it's, it makes it almost the contrast is like more, I guess, impactful in that way, at least for me, because 
Yeah, he had that levity, which I wasn't expecting necessarily watching it the first time. But on on subsequent watches, you know, it's like, wow, like he really like, and I, I even said this after that first watch, I was talking to someone about the movie and I was like, I said two performances really made me feel like sick, you're like nauseous, like thinking about them. And it was Jessica, Rebecca Ferguson, obviously, but then also Bardem as Stilgar, because he, the way he goes and becomes so, he's so manipulated basically by what's going on with Paul and he's so fervent about it. Um, like he, you feel bad for him. And yeah, ultimately at the end of it, I think that that which to me just meant that it worked in my thought process, at least. So if there is anything that embodies evil in this movie, then it's the house with their um, their greed and their thirst for blood. And I'm sure that the life expectancy is bound to be far below average on Getty Prime. Oh, <laughs> <with, with laughs> yeah. <their> blood. <laughs> like um, whether servants, uh, noble uh, like um, or military officers, it doesn't matter. You're, you know, you can die at any moment uh, at their whims. Um, and nobody embodies that monstrous nature more than Austin Butler in his portrayal of uh, Fade Ralph, a hair apparent of the house. And yeah, we, he, he, he was uh, focused for a good chunk at the middle of the movie with the, the arena and being assigned to the governor of Arrakis. Uh, but there was also an intriguing scene that was unique to this movie where we actually see him interacting with Lady Margot and she actually tests uh, Fade with the Gondra Bar. Uh, Garen, when, when you think of Fade being more explicitly set up as one of the Bene Gesserit's prospects and Given he survived the test, he's being positioned also as more of an equal to Paul. What, what was your reaction? This is actually something that I did really like. Um, I, I was shocked by it. I, I literally, when the, in the moment when uh, uh, Lady Fenring is, pulls out, put your hand in the box, I was like blown away. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I didn't, I didn't even imagine that to, to be in the story. But I, I thought the layered nature and all the different um, elements of Fade was so well done. And I know I'm, I'm fast becoming a, a super fan of Austin Butler. I just thought this Fade depiction, we had talked earlier in some of the episodes about him being just this wild, crazy fanatic, right? Well, he does that in the arena, right? Because mm -hmm. it's no, oh, and he is bloodthirsty and he's going to prove that he's the, the ascendant to his, to the Baron, but I, I really liked that moment where he, he is seduced as it were, he, he is in a way of kind of manipulated. And I just thought the, the dynamic of that character was so well done. And even though fade in the book is, is, you know, has, has a couple of different aspects to him. I just thought this kind of took it to the next level. And I really liked that because you really are comparing, um, whether you realize it or not that fade is the mirror to Paul. And I, I just thought that was very well written and very well uh, depicted in the film. That scene came as a complete surprise to me because, you know, we've seen all the trailers and TV spots. This is something that's not in the book. Um, there was no hint of that beforehand. Um, and just that callback to part one with fade being tested like Paul. Again, you know, Paul should be a daughter who had a, a son with fade. Uh, so you know, they are both parts of the breeding, breeding plan. Um, and that, that sort of visual way of showing just fade is the equal to Paul uh, as part of the plan uh, just was absolutely perfect in my mind. You know, I, I think Austin Butler was my MVP of part two. I didn't expect it to be. And I, but I was just like, wow, this is working for me. The charisma's there. Like, I just, you know, like, because, you know, I was very skeptical of, like, bald, scary fade, you know, but he he had it somehow. He still was this kind of, like, enigmatic figure that drew me in. Um, and what I really loved was this implication that the Bene Gesserit have been scheming for so long with, for so, in so many ways, that the Harkonnens being these, like, psychotic, like, un unpredictable people like that is just another day. They have strategies for that. Right. Like, oh, there's a, you know, the Kwisatz Haderach is popping up here or maybe over there. It's like, nah, we're we have strategies. We have we know exactly what we're going to do to manage our resources. And I, I really like that. I loved that. They were like, oh, yeah, we can control him. Don't worry about it. Because <laughs> um, that just shows you just how entrenched the Bene Gesserit are and how confident they are that whatever is happening in the universe, they are going to be the power player. Yeah, they definitely controlled it, the universe. There's no doubt about that. And I feel like this movie, with the stuff with uh, Faye and also the stuff with Aralon, 
shows that these ladies are in charge and they're forced to be reckoned with, as we find out later in the books. But awesome butler, man. Like, I, like, when he got cast, I remember we were like, who? What? <laughs> this kid that's supposed to be Elvis? And then I watched <laughs> Elvis when it came out on a home release, and I was like, wow, that was the best movie of the year. I totally buy him as Elvis. But then I was afraid that he was going to do, like, his Elvis voice, you know, like Paul Atreides. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I followed him as Elvis for such a long time. But what Austin does is he really takes that Faye Rafa energy that we know and puts it at 11. Like, it's a whole different thing. Even his voice, you know, he said that he's try sounding like the Baron because he grew up with the Baron, which makes perfect sense. And in the clip that we keep seeing nonstop about may I may my knife ship and shatter too. Like I said, he says that to Paul, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. I don't believe in your low fremen ways without saying a word. And that's why it should have been. Like mm -hmm. the other day I watched the eighty four movie and Sting is just such that, comic that, really. <laughs> Johnny, we gotta do a special episode once you I'm finally watch it. I'm watching it this week. Okay. Oh. okay. Curious to know what you're going to think about it. You know, in, the, in their final conflict, I was struck. I was like, my mind slipped them. Like, could they have played each other? Right. Oh, and I felt wow. like that was a really successful moment for me, just interpreting the film, like the way that maybe I, as intended, because they are supposed to maybe like, they could have done <laughs> each other's jobs. And I think, um, I was really worried that it was just going to be really scary. Like he was just going to be like a, a murderer kind of, you know, like why would anyone put up with this guy? Why is he, being ex you know, just like exterminated because he's so unpredictable, but he just, he had the riz. He had something about him. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised. But Batista and him where you're yeah. like, Oh, okay. Like we knew he was a little bit cuckoo for Coco Pop, <laughs> but like, this we really see like don't mess with Faye. And I love that Denise kept him for a second part. Yeah. And introduced him at that point. We were spending a lot of time with the Fremens. And then we're gonna move the camera over here to Giddy Prime. We're gonna see what their culture is like. But it also gives you such an impact when he he's on the stage. Like we he's not in it that much, but when he is, he's like you won't forget his scenes. Yeah. That's how powerful he is. Two quick hits before we go to the next thing. To Rachel's point, I love what you said about them paralleling and how they how they could have played each other potentially. Because I think there's even that line in the book from either Lady Margot or uh, Count Venering where they say, uh, "If only he had been, it's like in the house of like an Atreides or something like mm -hmm. what? How formidable he could have been." Um, so I, I like that you pointed that out. And then also to Simon's point, bringing up Raban. Yeah, like they're, they're, they really just have like the one scene together, I think. Um, well, then and then the uh, throne room at the end. But I really liked how they, I feel like they really played up those characters as like to contrast them as much as possible, which I thought worked really well uh, to the film's credit, especially since Raban isn't quite as present in the book as he is in, in the movies. They put him in a little bit more, um, or made him a little bit more active, per se, including like the first scene uh, that, the Raban has with the Baron in his tub, and then this first scene that Fade has with Baron in his tub. Just the way that those interactions are just completely different. Um, the way that you know they depict how they go about like controlling like spice production, and, like the, there are different approaches to that. I thought that that was really well done, and even the ceremonies where the Baron gives them you know control of Arrakis, like the reaction that they have in those scenes and the way the Baron interacts with them is just totally opposite. So I, I thought that that was nicely done, mm -hmm. just through some more subtle subtle things yeah. and it's important to remember here that even though the the harkonnen the name is is gone with, with with the death of fate actually harkonnen blood is going to be sitting on the on the imperial throne that's uh something that we're going to see uh further down the line in, in dune Sire. and yeah we, with with so many characters in this movie we didn't get to spend too much time with the crinos and unfortunately that meant there were no shots showing the grandeur of kaitain the imperial capital uh, we got some more intimate uh, interior ga garden scenes uh, Simon, you were right in your assessment of the emperor in early episodes. You were talking about this is a man who's who's done and thinking about his legacy and succession. To what extent do you feel, if at all, he still had power? I feel like he had power by name, but he was just done. 
he was just getting everything ready for Errol on and just being like, what would you do, daughter? Cool. That sounds good. I'm tired. I need a nap. I, I'm going to go drink some hot tea and just relax. But um, I was disappointed that we didn't get much of Christopher Walken, but he has a presence. And like when Johnny, I think, and I think it was off air, but the whole scene when Paul's like, kiss the ring, that right there showed that he was done. He was defeated. And I, I love that Erlon still has a small part. We'll be bigger in Messiah, but we got more of Erlon and she's working with the Benny Jesuit. We see this all in motion. Like I said in one of the previous episodes, Denis brought her in. It was like, I'm going to give you about 10, 15 minutes of screen time. If that, like Zendaya in part one. But don't worry, part two, you'll be right up there. You'll be one of my top hitters. And you know what's funny is they keep showing all four of them. Zendaya, Tim Tim, uh, Pew, and Austin. And they're like, the face of dude. I'm like, well, Austin's not really <laughs> the face <laughs> of dude after this movie. But um, I I love it. And I I like Christopher Walken's just, I'm done. I'm tired. You know, and I like that he felt bad about the death of Duke Leto. And that's something that kind of hinted at in the book, but never really brought up to. Because let's face it, Dune's about family. He said so <laughs> I'll, I'll say it's all, all about family <laughs> and closeness. <laughs> Real quick to uh, Simon's point. I think, yeah, so we don't get very much time with them in this movie, of course, but we also don't really have that much time with them in the in the book either. So I I, I personally didn't mind it that much. I knew I preferred the focus being on the Fremen and and uh, the Harkonnens. But I liked the depiction of the Emperor for the simple fact that I think for an audience that isn't familiar with the book or like it doesn't like understand, it just has the con context of part one. Like the way he's portrayed in this, it you kind of understand pretty quickly like why he did what he did in part one. Like, you, you can tell he's at the end of his rope. He is, like, over the hill, so to speak. And he's kind of in a desperate situation. Like, he's like, okay, what can I do to, like, consolidate myself and, like, make make myself more powerful? Take out the Atreides. You know, pass that off to the Harkonnens to kind of, like, placate them to some extent. Um, and when Wadib starts to rise, like, he doesn't have the answers. He's just like, oh, God, like, what do I do? He turns more to Irulan, which gets her a little bit more involved, makes her a little bit more forward in the story. Um, so I, and, and her depiction even is quite different from the books, obviously. Um, and I'm excited to see how that's developed. But yeah, I thought to me, I was like, I, I think some people were a little off put because you're like, oh, the emperor of the known universe, like he's got to be like the most commanding, like domineering, like guy in the world. But no, like at one point though, he was, and you can, I think you can still feel that because it's Christopher Walken and he has that vibe. The way he talks to the Baron at the end, you're like, okay, he has that presence. 20, 30 years ago, you would have been like really terrified of this guy. There's a great interview where they ask Chris Christopher Walken um, how he went about playing the emperor. And he said that when he first was asked to do this role, he's like, I'm this kid from Brooklyn. Like, how do I, how can I be a king? You know, I don't even know, I don't even know what to do. And he, he said someone had told him along, along the way in his career, he said, the king doesn't have to do anything because he has all power. What you do is you just respond. People treat you like the king. People treat you like an emperor. And, and when I saw that interview, I, I was kind of intrigued. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe instead of him being uh, over the hill, as it were, he just has had so much omnipotent power for so long that he doesn't even need to bother himself with speaking very many words. So. He's just, he has the power that comes through. Again, I agree with you guys. Great choice in choosing Christopher Walken. Reverend Mother says that, you know, the emperor is basically doing what she's told him to do. So it sounds like the emperor, it, making explicit that the emperor really has got no power. All the decisions are made by the Bene Gesserit. And so even though Paul is now on the throne at the end, you know, the Bene Gesserit has positioned Irulan to be the empress. And so the Benny Jesuit is still planning to pull the strings and how that will play out in Messiah. 
uh, it will be interesting to see how that sort of time jump works or no time jump or however they, they structure that. But yeah, the, the Benny Gesserit are really clear that they are the ones uh, in control of the universe. It's not the Emperor, it's not the Guild. It's, it's Benny Gesserit. Yeah, that, that's a good transition to our last faction. And it's interesting because not only is Irland played as a stronger successor to the Golden Lion throne, but she's also mentioned as um, you know a strong Bene Gesserit student, which that clearly wasn't wasn't the case in the in the book. Um, but yeah, so the last faction represented in the movie uh, may actually be the greatest. Uh, Denis Villeneuve uh, started um, in interviews that he was fascinated by the Bene Gesserit in the book, and that his adaptation was focusing on their story. Um, and indeed, the sisterhood are shown to be the true puppet masters of the Imperium. And it, it is an astonishing revelation in a way where Reverend Mother Mohaim reveals that it was the Bene Gesserit design. Uh, through her influence on the emperor that resulted in the destruction of House Atreides. That's an angle that, that wasn't in the book, at least not, not directly. And knowing that the, um, the sisterhood was destroying the Atreides, that really adds another level of poignancy to Lady Jessica's defiance in, in having a, a son. Uh, Rachel, what, what are your thoughts um, on the Bene Gesserit and Villeneuve's application? Is there anything you would have liked to see handled differently? I mean, I, I uh, was going to say, oh, you know, it's very clear that the, the Bene Gesserit are the ones pulling the strings for the emperor, right? They're the ones behind the scenes. They, it seems to be getting set up as a uh, Bene Gesserit, as the kind of main villain of the, the full arc of this, because um, House Atreides and Emperor Paul are not doing what they want them to do. My, what, what falls apart for me is why. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, I feel like the, the, the Kwisatz Haderach thing kind of got waylaid a little bit. And, and so now we have this setup where, you know, it's clear that the Bene Gesserit are pulling the strings and that they're, you know, moving one emperor out and accepting one in, even if they kind of planned for it to be fade, it, it seems like, but hey, you know, the desert rat came in and defeated him. Uh, so like that makes sense to me, but w one of the things that really struck me was that there, there needs to be other, there needs to be the guild. There needs to be spice. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even connect that the worms are the spice in this film. So I was very, um, confused as to why the Bene Gesserit care so much beyond the fact that this is like their breeding program for whatever end. Um, so that is kind of like my biggest takeaway in terms of like criticism. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I really like that the Bene Gesserit are being put forward. But in terms of like their motivations, I am very confused as to what their motivations actually are. I feel like you do need the other uh, sections of, like you said, the Space and Gill. So important. Charm and all that. But once again, if we bring all that up, it's a epic TV, yeah. <laughs> epic TV series, you know, where each chapter could be an episode just by itself. Like when I was going back and reading the last part, I was like, I, and I keep thinking about the gurney not trusting Jessica. Then that that's not even hinted at in either one of the movies. That could have been an episode just by itself when they confront each other. But for right now, I'll take this further. You know, Denis, yeah. beautiful job. You know, a lot better than the lunch movie. <laughs> I still love the lunch movie. Still a guilty pleasure. The Dravunovsky movie would have been, I I don't know. I, I haven't done that much drugs in my life. I don't understand <laughs> what that was. But um, unless you do a mini series, and maybe that's something that'll be done 20 years down the line. And I, I do love that the Benny Jessards are so important in the movie. So like that, when the show comes out, it won't feel out of left field and be like, well, why should I care about them? Because they've been there all along. Yeah. But yes, I, I agree. think it's about maintaining their power at this point, I think, in this in this particular adaptation. I And I think that's probably fine. But for me, the lack of emphasis on the spice, and I know that they say several times, I'm going to blow up the spice fields. But that it's to me, it's not made clear enough what that actually means. Um, right. So, yeah. And what they do well in the lunch movie is like, if Paul stops complete production of the spice, then yeah, there's, mm -hmm. well, there's payback. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
He who controls the spice. Yeah. The houses are here in orbit. How did they get there? I wonder. Like, explain that to me. Well, Well, once again, to be fair, in part one, they do explain what spice is and what it does, space travel and all that. So I guess they're counting on people remembering, like, from the very beginning of the prior prior movie. But yeah, and I I, I, I just felt five hours ago. I just, I also just felt like, "Mm," but he's like not just destroying navigation he's destroying the economy people are going to starve to death because not just because you're unleashing a religious war because there's no food going to thousands of planets <laughs> you know like I, yeah. I just for me dune is always about resource management the you know the planet of arrakis is a main character the Benny Gesserit and the guild and the fremen and all these different factions are really just people trying to get their share of this pie because they've created such a horrible monopoly on the way that the economy works, right? And for it's just a huge problem for me. The Bene Gesserit just being like, we have a Kwisatz Haderach program and we're almost there and we're just not going to quit. But why? <laughs> right? It's like, oh, we're all, we're all trying to, to shrug off the yoke of, of, you know, not just ruling, but navigating the universe of, of, the the conceit is that there are no computers, right? And obviously things happen later on. But this idea that you can have all knowledge all the time and <laughs> rid yourself of the monopolies of every other faction that has their own interlocking, you know, system, I think is is it really important for me in this the way that I kind of grok Dune. But mm-hmm. the yeah, I don't know. I just I felt like oh, okay, they're just moving. To get back to the film, I they're just moving people around to maintain their own influence, and I guess that's fine. I, that that that's a, I think a perfectly valid interpretation. But there's just so much more weird stuff in there, and I want <laughs> I want it to be bubbling to the surface a little bit more. And let's not all forget whoever played that Dune Part Two in the early 2000 PC game. It was all about spice management. It was yeah. all about. You know, even Spice Wars right now is mm-hmm. all about spice management. So yeah, I, you know, it, it's not a, it's not like it makes it a bad film. I just felt like I don't understand why the emperor is even here, like because the Benny Gesserit told me to. So what? I'm the emperor. No, right? Like, what is the yoke that they have on him? Uh, why would you know? Why would the guild be like? No, no, we're, we're going. Everyone's going to Arrakis right now. Uh, yeah. And I think that also plays into how they kind of minimized Paul's like prescience because they, there's the one a wonderful Jameis line. I love that Jameis pops up every now and then of of the the waves of being able to see across the waves and through the waves. Um, but there's nothing in there about what does the Quisatz Hatterak do to disrupt this system. Um, maybe we'll get more of that in Messiah. Mm. Just one quick point on uh, Jameis. I thought it was interesting on a rewatch uh, at the start. Uh, Stilgar says, you know, don't talk to the jinns, they'll possess you. And what happens? Paul talks to this jinn, Jamis, and then he becomes possessed and he goes off on a holy what? You know, Stilgar won him right at the start. Should have listened to Stilgar. <laughs> hey, one thing I really liked about how Villeneuve put together the, the Benny Chesseret influence. Um, of course, I, I first read the novel when I was like 14, so I wasn't, I wasn't mature enough probably to understand a lot of it, but the Bene Gesserit in the book are pulling the strings from the shadows and the way Villeneuve has, has weaved them into these two films, they're also in the shadows. They're, they're, they're behind all of this political interaction that's in your face and and I, I really like that creative choice of, of having them. I mean, uh, the Reverend Mother Mahayam, she doesn't have a lot of screen time. I, I, maybe, maybe a little more in, in part one, perhaps. But, but yet, because I know the story, and hopefully with subsequent uh, rewatches of the film, people who haven't read the book will, ca- will catch on to that element that they really are in the power position that they, they really are the ones that are manipulating the universe and, and, and to be able to explore all of those reasons and all of their motivations. I like how you brought that out, Rachel. Hopefully that will be explored in, in, in the TV series. I, I really hope so. I think that's a, a great wealth of opportunity there to do that. 
but I did agree with how, um, in fact, I just love in part one, um, that, that, that scene with the Herald of the Change and, and the music that's going on in the background. And, and I, I think it's Reverend Mother, uh, Romalo. I can't remember exactly who it is. And she looks right at, at Jessica and then looks at Paul. And that moment is so powerful to show the influence and what the expectations are from the Bene Gesserit. And I feel like that's what Villeneuve kind of did in part two as well. He, he had them come in at the right moment to create that foreboding feeling of, wait a minute, I forgot about these Bene Gesserit. They are really the, <laughs> hurting the show here. Yeah. You know? so and Margot and Irulan are dutiful, right? They do what they're told. Yep. Mm-hmm. They use their bodies the way that they're, you know, they have to. They use their influence. They are the opposite of Jessica. Well, that, that was a, a lot in this movie, but even with total runtime of over five hours across uh, part one and part two, there's a long list of missing elements from the book that were dropped completely in the screen adaptation. So uh, let, let's, let's do um, yeah, a, a round table. Uh, which uh, character, scene, or uh, plot would you most like to have seen uh, in this movie that didn't make the cut, uh, Garen? So one of the parts of the story that has always been one of my favorite is the Spacing Guild and the guild navigators and what the spice does to them physically and, and to their minds. So I, I missed that. I, I wanted, I thought, I was kind of hoping that in part two, Villeneuve would weave that back in or somehow uh, in, in, enhance that element of the story. So if I had to choose, I'd have him put some of that back in. Um, and then just overall, uh, you know, just my, my feelings are what a great, even though I, I'm conflicted. There's things that I'm still processing. There's things that I, kind of reactions and emotions I'm still sorting through. What I love about this film and what I love about what Villeneuve has done with part one and part two is there's so much to talk about. There's so much to analyze. There's so much to uh, compare and experience through other people's perspectives that um, I, I think this is a movie. I think these are movies we're going to be talking about for a long time. And for that reason, I am, I'm really pleased. It would have been very cool to see some more of, of the guild, um, to, you know, get them involved a little bit more in terms of the greater context of the story, kind of what Rachel was get, uh, getting into earlier. And also just the visual of, of the guild and, and, and the Herald of the Change scene from part one, that was so cool having them around again and explored a little bit more would have been, I think something I like, just cause the factions are a really interesting part of, of Dune, um, and of course, going forward, that'll be a key point. So would have been interesting to see how they would have included that. Um, for me, though, overall, I mean, it's not going to be a surprise to anyone. I, I just am like over the moon about how this has gone. It's like I saw, I, for, I had the fore, foresight that this was uh, going to be hopefully something people would connect with. And um, part one was its own challenge. And, you know, that was early in the pandemic. And the release was on HBO at the same time it was in theaters. And yeah. I was going to say the guild as well. But I- can't do it a third time so i'll i'll go for fufia because we we know he's we know his scenes were shot so i went into the film expecting to see at least some of fufia and unfortunately he he's uh, another victim of the cutting room floor um which is sad to say um uh, in terms of june itself uh, a fantastic movie uh yeah i've still got to work through some issues of between how great a film it is and the the faithfulness of the adaptation and the, all the, the missing weirdness um, between those. I, but I will say that I think people, you know, having sort of come to terms with these differences between the film and the book for Denimu Villeneuve's Dune, um, perhaps would need to um, re-evaluate Lynch's Dune because he had less than half the time of Dune Part 1 and 2 and the amount of dune he got into those films uh, is really incredible, and I'm a big fan of Lynch's Dune, and this just sort of reinforces my my fandom of that. I think. Well, I'm always Team Guild. We know that, but uh, yeah, I also miss the Mentats. You know, there's those are some of the best names in fiction: Thufar Hawad and Peter Devries and uh, Hasimir Fenring. Like these, you know, I, I wish that we had more of, of of that kind of weird alternate technology kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, I, and my overall reaction is more like, I feel like that Paul Rudd meme where he's on Hot Ones and he's like, look at us, look at us. You know, if you told 15 year old me that we'd have such an amazing, 
I would say Oscar worthy film, you know, adapting, you know, my favorite story. I wouldn't believe you. So it's been really exciting and enjoyable to connect with people about this story that, you know, I think is now made much more accessible and more understandable to to folks that may not have read the books, which means they get all my references now, which is great. And uh yeah, I, it's very exciting, the quality, the level that it's at. And when we're nitpicky, it's because, you know, we're just book fans. <laughs> like Rachel said, why we're nitpicky? Because we care. That's why. Uh, I would love to see the gills. But once again, it goes back to a whole 20 plus hour miniseries. So like I keep saying, for Denis Villeneuve's Dune, I am beyond happy. Frank Herbert will always be the source material, but we've evolved. We've had different versions. I'm grateful that, you know, I didn't think 40 years ago when my parents gave me these weird action figures from this weird art film uh, that I would be talking about still to this day and making friends over the internet. So don't go anywhere. It's not because the movie's out that we're done. Yeah, and I think for, for me, the biggest missed opportunity, and, I, and I'll say, say it that, that way, is that we didn't have uh, Leto the second or Leto 1.5, as, as Marcus was, was pushing in, in this movie. I feel with, with actors like Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya, who gave these amazing performances, I think it's really a miss that we didn't see the, the dramatic scene of them losing their, their, their first child. So that, I think that, that would be like uh, the, the biggest missed opportunity in my mind. Um, but yeah, look, look, look at the, the movie uh, overall, and, and I've said this before in my initial reaction, and that hasn't changed after the repeat viewings. This, this is the best movie that I've seen in cinema since The Lord of the Rings. And I can imagine that once we have, you know, the part three or Messiah, however he's going to call it, that this is going to be one of my favorite trilogies. I don't think it will surpass Lord of the Rings. That will r remain my, my favorite. But yeah, th this is just an amazing cinematic uh, achievement. And uh, as an adaptation of, of Dune, as, as mentioned, I, I think, you know, we, we had to have more, more time, you know, whether, whether it was three movies of this length or, or longer or, or longer series uh, that would have done um, much better for this, this adaptation. But as, as a movie, this is uh, just, just uh, amazing. So I'm, I'm sticking to my score. It, it wasn't perfect, but definitely, you know, like uh, excellence um, uh, all around. So, um, yeah, that was our full spoiler review of Dune Part 2. And this was, uh, went on a longer discussion than, than we expected. Uh, but yeah, you can expect a, a lot more in the coming weeks and months as we'll be coming at you with uh, in-depth scene-by-scene breakdowns of an entire movie, as well as some amazing interviews. Uh, for today, it's, uh, it's time to sign off. Hey, once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for commenting. Please like, subscribe. You know the whole shebang. If you want to follow me on social media, it's S. Dowdy pretty much everywhere. Thanks for having me once again. I really do enjoy these talks. You can find me on Instagram at Darth underscore Rachel, uh, where I might be making more Dune costumes. So, uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be back and we can discuss more, more implications of Denis's interpretation. Uh, thanks for having me back on. It's been great. I feel like I've been in therapy for two hours, just sort of letting it all out and stuff. Um, it's great. Uh, if anyone wants to follow me, I'm doing info on all the socials. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for the support, tuning in. Uh, definitely give us your thoughts and feedback. Uh, there's a lot to digest and, and talk about. So it's an exciting time. It's really out there. People are getting to enjoy it, um, break it down. And it's been a long road to, to get to this point. And uh, there's still plenty to come. So stay tuned. And you can find me on social media at Johnny Sobchuk. And we'll see you in the next one. Hey, thanks for everyone for watching. Really thanks to the Dune crew here. Really, really appreciate everyone's thoughts and ideas. And, you know, I, I, I know I started with conflict and I still feel some of that, but I'd really like to know what, what many of you who are watching or listening feel about your experience with the film. It, it really makes for, for great analysis and great conversation. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is Marcus. Uh, you can find me writing at dunism.com and on social media at Marcus is writing. Uh, so yeah, a lot more to come in Dune Talk in March and beyond. Until the next one, take care. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to dunenewsnet.com and add us to your social feeds.
Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.